That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Ramey. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast, and we help people stay sober. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thanks to Humans Music for bringing us in. And we've been listening to Humans Music for no goodbyes, just some time now world. coming into the show. For years now, man. So just a shout out to those guys. Much love. Appreciate the good vibes coming you. in. Hope you're doing well today. Another day breathing. That's always a good day. Never me down. I guess it depends how you look at it. But <laughs> it's your choice, right? If you're looking for ways to quit drinking, a couple options for you. You can go to thatsoberguy.com. You can check out our courses, mastermind groups, one-on-one coaching options. You can also book a 30-minute strategy session with me so we can talk about your goals. I can answer any questions you might have. We can see if we uh, if we might be able to help. So uh, you can also follow us on Instagram at that sober guy podcast. All the links from today will be in the show notes. So very easy for you to find couple of announcements before we jump in today to this Ask Me Anything Q&A session. I'm going to try to start doing these once a month now. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. I wanted to mention a new website that we're working on uh, where there's going to be some different options, uh, some community options. Um, it's basically, I'm pulling everything together in one dashboard, in one site. Uh, and I'm having somebody help me with this who is a master at doing this. So I'm really excited. Uh, he's actually working on that as we speak, uh, and it should be done in the next couple of weeks. So uh, I'm pumped for that. It's just going to help me o- stay organized better and and really um, bring everything, the communities, masterminds, coaching, uh, the podcast, everything together. Uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, much easier for me uh, to manage Sober Guy as well, uh, being that I don't have a huge team. I'm pretty much doing this um, on the solo with some with some help from the lovely Jess and, uh, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this dashboard new website thing is just, is going to be a huge help. So stoked about that. Uh, also wanted to mention, uh, mastermind groups, um, we have a mastermind group coming up in the fall. We still have some spots available. Um, I would love to talk to you and, uh, see if you're interested. I can, uh, answer any questions you might have. Uh, so once again, you can go to that sober uh, you can book a 30 minute strategy session with me. We can talk about your goals. Uh, you can, uh, Uh, ask questions about the mastermind. What does it look like? I actually did a podcast too. should have probably referenced this just a couple episodes back. I think two episodes back. I think it was titled five reasons why every uh, man should join uh, a sober mastermind group. So if you are interested, you can go back and listen to that as well. And that'll help answer maybe some of the questions you have and give you some more info about what a mastermind is, uh, what a sober mastermind is, um, how how it can help you, uh, what it looks like, uh, what it's done for others. I shared some of my own experience in being a part of mastermind groups uh, as well as leading them uh, too. So good stuff over there. I uh, also wanted to mention um, taking submissions for Ask Me Anything uh, in, uh, let's see, we're in August now. So this will be for October. So if you have questions, and I'll probably make a post on on social media as well as in our men's uh, group on in locals, the Sober Guy Men's Group which is where these questions come from today. So stoked to, uh, to, to hear what these are. Um, but lost my train of thought there for a minute. Ask me anything. Here's what I want you to do. And then actually, I guess I should just include this as well. Also sober shout outs. Okay. So here's what I'm trying to do. I'm all over the place here. Um, let me just bring it back together. Cause I'm excited. Cause I haven't recorded in a while. Cause I've been down, down for the count, man, with some kidney stones and man, that's a whole nother issue. And I'm going to talk about that on a separate podcast and go through that whole thing, what this last month has been like. And it's just, it's been insane. I'm starting to feel a little better and stuff, but get into that later. Okay. I'm doing two things. I'm trying to get a little more organized. One of my downfalls, I think, is I'm such a creative guy. I'm a writer, a musician. I'm an artist. Like I love creating stuff. I love podcasting. I love creating conversations. Um, I love it. I'm very passionate about it. And I have a lot of ideas. And a lot of the times, a lot of those ideas, some of them come to fruition, some of them don't. And I'm not the master. Um, I, I'm, I'm really good at creating, but I'm definitely not the master of um, staying organized and 
uh, following through on things sometimes. Uh, that, that's definitely one of the things that I struggle with. And so here's why I'm telling you this. What I'm trying to do is be a little bit more organized, create a little bit better of a system for sober guys. So there's two reasons why. Number one, obviously it helps you guys because we have a system and, and a lot of people are trying to make changes, live with purpose, be better dads, better husbands, better men, uh, and stay alcohol free, man. We like, we like routine. We like schedule and I'm pretty good about it in my personal life, gym, you know, health stuff, work. Um, I'm okay. I would say I'm, I've got, I've gotten a lot better. Uh, but as far as sober guy goes with this whole rebranding of the website, really bringing in mastermind groups, coaching community, really trying to build upon what we've been doing for the last 10 years, uh, and, and, and just really continue to grow. I have to be better organized. I have to have better processes and hopefully eventually, um, I will have a couple people on a team who are kind of helping me do this stuff. But, uh, for now, uh, this brings me back to ask me anything and sober shout outs on the first episode of each month. I'm going to do sober shout outs. So if you have your a sobriety date you're coming up on, please share it with me. Um, and I'll tell you how you can do that in just a second. Cause it's the same as the ask me anything. If you have questions and you want, uh, some advice or you want some experience that maybe how I might see something, or maybe I've talked to somebody that you have a question for, or about maybe a, pr a prior podcast, whatever it is. Maybe you have a question for Jess from a wife's perspective. I can pass that on to her too. She's going to be coming on the podcast uh, occasionally, actually here pretty soon. And uh, so we can take those questions as well. Here's what I want you to do. Email sobriety at that sober guy.com. And then in the, uh, in the subject line, just put, ask me anything. If that's your question, if you have a question for the show, uh, and then we'll read those on, on the last episode of each month. Or if you have a sober shout out, you're coming up, you want to celebrate your date. Um, we'll do this at the beginning of the month. Just write sober shout outs in the subject line. And then tell me a little bit about, uh, about what you're celebrating, how long, um, a, a little brief description of yourself, uh, how the show's helped you, whatever, whatever you want to do, uh, is fine. So I appreciate you guys doing that. Really trying to involve everybody. Um, and just, man, I want to continue to grow this platform and continue to help a lot of people. And I really, the ultimate goal is to bring people, uh, with a spiritual connection, uh, to God and, and to Jesus Christ. And that's, that's really my ultimate goal at the end of the day, um, with all this. And of course, stay, stay sober, stay away from alcohol, um, be better fathers, husbands, all that good stuff that we talk about on here. Uh, and also just have some fun, man. Be excited about life, be motivated, be healthy, be strong all those things. And especially for me, just coming off of being down for like a month, man, it's put a lot of things in perspective. And I'm, I'm like, I already mentioned, I'm not going to talk about it today, uh, but I really am excited about talking about it because it's really put some things in perspective for me. Um, and just in life in general and just the day to day, uh, the day to day grind. And then also the importance of taking care of ourselves and being healthy and really, um, you know, really being at the top, our, our the top of our game, I guess, to the best of our ability as we continue to age, as life continues to change, as life continues to throw curveballs at us too, man. That's you know, that's a that's a tough one too. We 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 have things that come up sometimes. We just go, man, I don't. How are we going to do this? How how am I going to do that? You know, and so being strong mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, all those things is so so important. And that's one of the, one of the reasons that I continue to, um, you know, to, uh, to do sober guy and, and continue to, uh, try to grow the platform and connect with all of you out there. So I appreciate you guys. Um, anything else here? Let's see. Uh, I already said the email. Well, yeah. So I guess before we get into this, ask me anything, I just want to give some love to our guys for sending these questions out, um, from our locals men's group. If you're interested in that too, you can go on the website, that's sober uh, and you can find on there, I think it is the connect tab or re resources tab, I think. Oh, excuse me. Um, you can go on there and find the sober guy men's group on the locals platform and check that out if you're interested in joining. Okay. So big breath. Let's take a little sip of water here. A little sip. All right. This first question from is from Kevin. And uh, Kevin, thanks for uh, the couple of questions. What do you have? One, two, three. Love it. Three questions today from Kevin. So the first one, and guys, just so you know, 
I did take some bullet points uh, just to kind of help, you know, help with responses and thoughts that I was having as I was kind of reading through these. But I really, my love is just to kind of be very authentic and just kind of answer them as, you know, like without a lot of detail in them. So I'm going to do my best to do that. Uh, Okay, Shane, uh, have you found in your sobriety that you would get upset and resentful at your wife for drinking? Sometimes it just bothers me. Other times it doesn't. She doesn't have a problem. It's my problem. But I still wish she'd be on this journey with me knowing uh, how hard it is. I've come to really love the mental clarity. So I don't understand why a drink or two is even needed. And such a great question. Such a struggle. Uh, I remember when I first came home from rehab from the Rahab. I can't believe I went to rehab sometimes. It's so crazy to me. I'm like, when I first came home from rehab, (laughs) like when I was 12, I never would have thought like, you're going to grow up, you're going to have a drug and alcohol problem and be a complete douchebag. And then you're going to ship yourself off to a 30 day treatment facility called rehab with a wife and two kids while you're potentially getting evicted because you have a serious issue, but you want to change it. So that's good. So I guess I'll give you that. Like, I never would have thought that. Like ever, it's so crazy to me. Even after ten years, I'm like, I, my, the reason I'm saying that is because it still feels weird sometimes when I'm like, when I went to rehab, and maybe that's a little, maybe there's a little bit of pride there still. Actually, now that I think about that, I think there's a little bit of pride. Is like, I got ten years sober now, and like I didn't, I went to rehab, and that part's behind me, and it's, it's not like a angry thing or anything, but it is a little bit weird. Anyways, okay. In any case. Great question again. Let me I start getting off track, man. But um, when I first quit, when I first got home from the rehab, it was so weird. I remember when Jess picked me up and we went to the beach because I was out in, uh, what was, I was in Sebastopol, the place. And then um, it's on like the Sonoma coast area. I guess it's Sonoma County. And uh, so we went straight to the beach and I remember just sitting on the beach and it, I think it was just her and I. And uh, I just, it was just so awkward, you know, because we had had so many years together of spending time together where alcohol was always at the focal point of everything social that we did. So if we went to a party, we were drinking. If we were at, you know, family's house for a holiday, we were drinking. If we attended a funeral, we were drinking. If we were just hanging out, we were drinking. Like we were always drinking and doing other stuff occasionally too. And so this, anytime we hung out, there was always this thing around alcohol. And so the fact that I had completely quit and completely thrown in the towel and completely given up and change everything, or at least at this point I was ready to it. And and I was on the beginning of that path to doing that. It was so weird because we only knew each other as, um, you know, as the, the people that we were when we were partying, I guess, I guess that's the best way I could put it. Um, but here's the thing. I know that Jess supported me and I know she loved me. We had a daughter at the time, uh, still have a daughter at the time, obviously, but uh, she was three at that time. And so she was little. And so we knew that, you know, there was a future for us, but man, some things were going to have to change and it was going to be, it was going to be tough. And uh, Jess was on board to support. I mean, she showed up for the therapy. We had family like group therapy when I was in treatment. And uh, she, you know, she was there and and she did not drink for the first, gosh, at least year or two, at least, um, you know, and, and so that was very, very uh, support. And it wasn't, and she didn't not drink because I didn't tell her you don't drink or you can't drink. She just like, she knew you know, and she was respectful of it. And I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say she didn't drink. There may have been a couple times where she did, but they weren't with me. So there, there may have been a couple times later on down the road, you know, six, you know, 12, a, a year in where she went out maybe one time with her girls and had some drinks or whatever. And I do remember that was the case because I remember her, she didn't drink for a while at first. And I remember her coming home and going, God, why did I even do that? Like that? Why did I even have a couple of drinks? I just feel like crap afterwards. Like there's no point. So, you know, th- there was that kind of um, limited, the, the limited drinking where she didn't have an issue. Okay. So there was that part as times passed, you know, she'll still occasionally have a glass of wine. It doesn't bother me. I'm not, it's not like a, it's not a party thing. It's a little different. 
Um, but I can understand how sometimes it would. Um, it would bother somebody because I think it depends on the situation. I think it depends what you're doing, where you're at, what's your intention, you know, why are you there? And we have to remember that, and you, you said this, Kevin, too, like it's it's your problem. It's not her problem. It's your problem, right? So we have to keep that in mind. Now, if it comes to a point where it's starting to be obnoxious and it's starting to be habitual and like there's an issue there, that's one thing. That's totally different. It doesn't sound like that in this case. So I think that, I think that we just have to let our spouses do what they're going to do. And I think we have to be comfortable where we're at and know that we're okay with ourselves and our own skin and our own social setting, which can be difficult sometimes. Trust me, I've been to plenty of weddings and birthdays and family get togethers and all the things where people are drinking and I'm one of the only ones who's not, or the only one who's not. And it can, even after 10 years, you, you feel a little bit, I mean, there's, let's just say, you just feel a little bit awkward sometimes, like no matter what, no matter how comfortable you are, there's always might be that little bit. I can say it gets a hell of a lot better as time goes on. Um, for me, I, it's more or less, I just get tired and I just don't, I don't, I'm not a late night dude anymore. I mean, I'm an early morning dude. I love like what used to be for me partying late at night, or I mean, the party didn't start till nine or 10 o'clock and then you were up all night. That sounds absolutely horrendous to me at any time. Like anything past 10, I'm like an 80 year old man. I'm like, oh God, good Lord. I should have taken a nap today. <laughs> I need a nap. I need to go to bed. This is lame. Look at all these idiots drunk and dancing and puke. <laughs> That's not fun to me anymore. Um, what's fun to me is getting to bed at a decent hour after I ate a good dinner and waking up early and, and drinking some water and then drinking some coffee and then getting my day going, reading the Bible a little bit, going to the gym. Um, man, to be honest, taking a dump in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favorite pastimes. That's one of the manliest pastimes there is. First thing in the morning, some coffee and some dumpage. It's a heck of a way to start the day. All right. It's probably too much info, but I'm just, that's just what it is. That, and I'm excited to wake up and see what God has for the day for me, for my family. Like what's next. And a lot of it's routine. It's a lot of the same stuff, you know, a lot of the time. Um, but I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't stray me from that. I don't want to stay up late and do that anymore. And so I don't even know how I got on this part of it. And it's not even relating to the question I just realized, but um, let me, let me, let me pull it back. Look like when our spouses are drinking or they're not drinking um, it's, it's really about where we're at. It, where, where are we at in our own spiritual, emotional, um, you know, uh, uh, mental state? Like where, where are we? We should be able to handle that and we should be able to communicate if that's bothering us too. Um, so I would just say, I mean, that, that's probably a good, a good spot to end on for this one is just keep the lines of communication open. If it starts to get out of hand, that's one thing. If it's just the occasional drink and your wife likes to have a glass of wine when you're hanging, like, the, like what's, I mean, there, that's her choice, you know? Um, and, and that's your choice to not, and you guys have to find some sort of, um, common ground in that. And, and talk about it and, and share how you're feeling, how you're, and, and it, and it has to come from a place of love, not from a place of like anger or resentment or anything like that, which can be difficult sometimes. So just make sure you're in that a good place, you know, maybe a public place. <laughs> That's like whenever Jess and I have to talk about something that I think might be like, you know, it could have a potential for an argument. I'm like, yeah, we probably need to go down to uh, the coffee shop and sit in public, or maybe we should go out to lunch. That way we're in public and we can't, you know, like yell at each other or anything because we don't want to look like complete asses in public. It's a good good option. Good option. I've used it sometimes. It works. All right, next, next question. I hope that answered that part of it too. I know I kind of went all over the place there, but at the end of the day, communication, like I said. Um, okay, so next question. Uh, have you ever had social anxiety, particularly with being a group who's drinking, and how did you manage that? It's another great, great, all these questions are great, but um, the social anxiety thing is real. Um, so I find I'll become uncomfortable, quiet, agitated if my wife is also drinking, um, and, it, and, I, and then I feel like a burden. Uh, I don't want to get so uncomfortable, um, but I also feel like I don't want to be a burden on others. I end up just wanting to escape and become real uncomfortable in these situations. Does it get easier with time? It's inconsistent when it happens. Yeah. Uh, and 
Whoa, had a burp there. A little bit of air in there, I guess, huh? Yeah. Man, I'm just like thinking about this question because there's there's a lot of parts to it, I feel like, and it's very relevant to not just you, Kevin, not just me, but so many other dudes out there. Like I think uh, like one for one for instance is my brother-in-law. Um, and, uh, my brother-in-law Gary, and I don't think he'll mind that I talk a little bit about him. I don't think so. It's nothing that he hasn't shared on the podcast. I think he was on with Seth a couple of, gosh, probably a year or two years ago. That's a great question. I think we called it, uh, blue collar sober. Ugh, I can't remember the name of it, but just, if you look for it, it's with Gary and Seth, great conversation just about just men being blue collar workers and and trying to stay sober and lead their families pretty much. And we had a, we had a lot of good things and some good sharing that we talked about um, from our own perspective and then also being in relationships and marriages and stuff too. So it might be a good one to go back and check out. But Gary really struggled with social anxiety. It was a big part of his, um, his habitual drinking over the years. And uh, it, it only got worse. It never got better. Uh, the drinking intensified, the anxiety intensified enough to where I know he had to, um, you know, get, get some, like get some help for it for particularly for not just for the alcohol, um, but for the anxiety itself, because there was such this social, um, you know, this, this social, uh, anxiety that was overcoming him. And, and I've heard this from a lot of different dudes too. And so what we do is we think when we drink, it gets rid of that and it might for the moment. But as it continues to go on, it just snowballs and it gets worse and worse and worse. The anxiety gets worse. The drinking gets worse. All that stuff gets worse. And so um, it, it can really build up over time is what I'm getting at. And so why am, I, why am I talking about that aspect of it? Because it's important to the other side of that coin is that now all of a sudden um, we're like not drinking. We're not using alcohol to kind of, you know... Um, I just want to say lube it up, <laughs> lube it up, <laughs> lubricate the moment. That sounds gross. I was, why, my mind is, oh God, I just have such a dude mind. Like, why does that sound gross? Well, I don't know <laughs> what well, you tell me <laughs> the lube. He had the lube. <laughs> it's like an Adam Sandler movie or something. All right. Um, we, we, all of a sudden we stop. Right. And we're like, okay, I'm this new person. I'm not drinking anymore. And then like, now I got to go into this lion's den of like people who are drinking at a party or a, or a family dinner or a wedding or whatever. And, and then, oh yeah, by the way, like some of my friends and like my, even my wife, she's still, but I'm the only one who's not doing it. Yeah. It, it can feel weird. So I guess here's what I'm saying. You're not weird. Number one for feeling like that, having that anxiety, having that you, you probably, that's probably why a lot of us drank for so long was because of the anxiety, because we didn't know who we were. We didn't know how to feel comfortable in social settings and alcohol. It, it, it lowers those inhibitions and it lowers the anxiety in the moment because it changes the way we feel, we think we act all of it. And, um, it might have a purpose for the short term in some of those moments, but the short term purpose, um, uh, is, well, how do I say that? The long-term effects outweigh the short-term purpose by a lot, you know, and, and obviously anyone who's drank for a long time and, and had issues with it knows that. Um, so, it, you know, community fellowship in this is so important too. Um, oh wait, did I just go down on that? No, I did move down on that. Sorry. Okay. So I'm looking at my notes now too, and I, I skipped the next down to the next one. That was the next notes I had. Um, I want to escape sometimes too. Okay. So like I said, that's normal. You're normal. Congratulations. Like it's not, don't feel weird because it's like, Oh, I just want to escape and get out of here. Or literally I just want to escape like period. That's why another reason we drank a lot too. Um, here's some, let me give you some solutions to this. Okay. It's a couple things that I use and, and I think I did a podcast on this, how to stay, how to stay or how to put together a sober game plan at weddings, parties, dinners, um, something along those lines. It was just a few episodes ago and I, I kind of went down how to game plan for this. And so it reminded me of this because this is one part of that. One of the solutions for these moments when you are at a party or you're with a group or you're out to dinner or something 
and I've talked about this before. I always feel like I am a broken record, but I do realize that this may be the first time somebody's hearing this today. One solution is to have non-alcoholic drinks of your own. Okay. I've found even like having something in my hand, something that I am, I, I just feel like I'm partaking in the social aspect of things. It's not about the alcohol. It's about the ritual of having a drink in a sense, the routine of having something in my hand, something I'm kind of sipping on or having a snack, maybe some peanuts or something with the, you know, with the club soda and cranberry or with, even if it's a cup of coffee or something, if you're, if, even if it's an NA drink, maybe you like athletic brewing or something and you want to try one of those in, in the situation, if that's your thing, if it's a trigger for you, the NA stuff, I know people have different takes on that. Don't do it. Know where you're at with your own emotions, where, where are you spiritually right now? That's a good way to tell like what works and what doesn't work. But I really like the idea of when you go out pre game planning, if you're going to dinner, every pretty much every restaurant has their menu online, go online and check and see what kind of NA drinks they have. So you can set yourself up. If you're going to a wedding, you know, they're probably going to have Coke, water, coffee, they may even have any beer. Who knows? Try to find that out beforehand. And if you have to bring your own, it's okay. Bring your own, bring a little cooler, put it in your car, you know, bring something up that you can feel comfortable. I think that helps. I know it's helped me out a lot. Um, and I've also found that after like a couple, like two, I don't even care anymore anyways. And then I usually start to get bored because everyone's getting drunk and I'm ready to, <laughs> I'm ready to go by the, by the end of the evening. So like I said, I'm like an 80 year old dude. I'm ready to get up early and like kick the day's ass, but late nights, man, you know, it's a whole different thing. But, um, the drunker, the people get to the more irritated and turned off I would get, uh, or I do get at any event. Uh, I'm like, that's another sign. It's time to go. And usually nothing good. What do they say? Nothing good happens after 10 or after 11 or after 12. I don't remember one of those times, but they're usually right about that. That's usually when all the crap goes down. If there's drama or if there's just a drunken mess. Um, I will tell you this, it gets e easier over time. Um, I don't know that it will ever go away per se, but I've just found that like, I try to rarely put myself in those situations anymore. Um, for the long term, unless I have to be there or unless I want to be there too. Like I just went to my niece's wedding, had a great time. There are some people who got smashed there at the wedding. Okay, I did some of the, I think I talked about this on one of the past episodes, actually. I did um, the MC and some of the music and stuff for my niece and tried to help out. We all, all, the whole family did. It was awesome. Beautiful wedding, beautiful place, lots of great family, lots of great friends. Um, had a great time. A lot of people getting smashed, though, and partying down. Have, they're having a great time, too. Um, you know, I, I would imagine some of them felt like dog shit the next morning, and so I'm not jealous of that at all. Um, but, like, about, you know, when I was kind of winding down, like I was ready to go. Like I was, I was ready to do my thing, go in, go to bed. Um, and it's, it was, I had a good time, but you know, I'm not on that level. Like I used to be. Um, and so and my point to that was I had an intention, um, my like, or I had, what's the word, not intentions. I had a reason to be there. I had a reason to be at the wedding to support my niece and her husband and um, our family. Like I wanted to be there for that. I wanted to be there for them. I wanted to help out. And I was, be, I was at one other thing too, I should add this before we move on. And this is in the list of game planning as well is find something you can help with be of service. Not only are you being of service and you're helping somebody out, which is amazing. I'm sure they're going to appreciate that. It also kind of helps to take your mind off of you. And get out of your own damn head, which happens sometimes. And that's why a lot of people drink because we're stuck up in our heads so much. We got so much stuff going on. Me, 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 me. It's like, no, nah, it's not really about you. It's not really about me. Get out of that head. That head is madness up there. I know. I couldn't ever understand it. I still can't understand it someday. Some of the thoughts I have, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and I, I've gotten a lot better on checking myself and going, God, I, I'm sorry, but it's a thought. There's a difference between a thought and acting on a thought or, you know, that, that's, there's certain things we can't control. We have to be able to recognize that too, but what's your intention and do you have to be there? Those are two good answers. And then, you know, back to the wife too, you know, just, man, that's, that's her choice if she wants to do that or not, you know, and you guys got to communicate about that back to the first question. Okay. Last one from Kevin here. 
Um, I've held off on going to AA probably because I struggle talking about myself unless it's on a platform like this. Okay, so you like the digital platform where it's more like a group, like we have the Sober Guy Locals group or there's different Facebook groups or um, more tight-knit digital groups. Good to know we're going to be creating a new Sober Guy community on the new platform and building that uh, in building that up and continuing to do the Locals 1-2 as for now, I'm not sure what that looks like, but I just love the fact you pointed that out because some people do struggle with that. Some people struggle with going out and going to an in-person meeting. However, I will say, if you can do that, do it. If you can at least give it a shot and try it one time, do it. I, I've been to some weird meetings. I've been to some ones where people were a little bit annoying or had shares that were like, dude, come on. But for the most part, I've never had a bad meeting before. I've never been to one where I didn't come out feeling a little bit better than when I went in or relating to somebody um, a little bit more than I thought I would, you know? And so the in-person stuff is, is, is really important, I think. And uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Um, okay. Let me finish the question first. And I'm getting ahead of myself and getting into the, the, um, my thoughts on it. I listen to podcasts. I'm involved in this group and that, that's the sober guy men's group, but that's it. My sober army is small around me, which I don't like. I don't have the shakes, tremors, et cetera. Is that right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what it is, et cetera. But what I do suffer from is the daily withdrawal from the drinking culture pushed every day by society. My biggest threat is the anxiety, whether social or stress, that drives me for a drink. How do I find the fellowship you talk about if I don't want to do AA? I live in a small community. I have an expansive network for my career. It would be nice to have a bunch of sober friends who live the same lifestyle. Yeah. So dude, like you have to get out and, and experience some sort of fellowship in person, I think at some point. You really do. I, I, I love the fact that, you know, we have the, the Sober Guy men's group on Locals. I love the fact that there's podcasts and there's all kinds of other groups and communities and stuff out there that there's online meetings as well. I think you can find some of those on the website. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not downing those or not encouraging those. I am. I think it's a, those are all great tools to have in the toolbox. But when we look in a toolbox as a whole, there's different shelves, right? So you got your digital meetings, you got your podcasts on the second shelf. You got, um, you, maybe there's like, uh, different, um, uh, online meetings on the third shelf, you know, and then the fourth shelf is in-person fellowship. Like, what does that look like? You know? And so let me give you a couple a couple of solutions here that I kind of jotted down. I've talked about these many times before, but community and fellowship is so important. Um, church is a great place to find this. So I don't know if you're a spiritual dude, you know, I, and even if you're not, that's okay. It doesn't mean that you can't go check something out and keep an open mind and be a part of a men's group. There's a lot of good men's groups at churches that aren't like super churchy. Like you would think, yes, the foundation is Jesus. The foundation is God, the foundation. Um, and you notice how I don't say religious, right? You guys don't hear me say that in the context of you need to find religion. There's a huge difference to me between religion and a relationship with God. And I'm not going to get into that right now, get on a soapbox about it, but it's so different. And it's unfortunate because I think it blocks so many men from experiencing like the relationship with God that they could have and, and, and seeing what God's purpose is for their lives, because maybe they had a bad experience. They were in a legalistic church. Um, maybe they have just had friends who were super religious and they were turned off by it. Like I totally get, can get that and understand that I was raised Catholic, very religious, no disrespect to the Catholics out there. Um, I did catechism, first communion confirmation. I did it all. We went to church on Christmas and Easter. I was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> stand, sit, stand, sit. A lot of great Catholics out there too. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't, you know, if anyone's listening to this and you're Catholic, I'm, I'm not bashing you. I'm just saying like, it was very ritualistic. It was very religious. I, I didn't have a connection to God there. I didn't have a connection to Jesus and I didn't get it until I was so broken and hurt and, and just desperate, desperate for something new. I was desperate for something more. 
And that is when Jesus took me and, and just opened my heart up. And literally I had a spiritual awakening in one moment one day when I was just about to get sober that changed my life forever. Whole nother story there. Didn't even plan on getting into that, but that's okay. My point is there's a ton of men's groups out there that there are some solid, great dudes in the church. So maybe you have a church in your community Try one. If it sucks, fine. Try another one. If that one sucks, try another one. You got to try stuff sometimes and and just put yourself out there. You know, just put yourself out there, man. I promise when you do that, I have three words I love. Just show up. I've used that for a long time. Just show up. And the caveat to that is just show up and God will do the rest. I promise you, if you open yourself up, people, and you'll be like, holy crap, I just met three new friends. Man, dude's cool. He's got a lot of shit in common that I do. Like, Wow. We like to smoke cigar. I, I went to one of my favorite men's groups. I only got to go to a couple of them. So I was so busy with the, with the kids sports and stuff on Saturdays, but my buddy Ian, he did a, uh, a men's bonfire group. It was once a month, I think the first Saturday or second Saturday. And I went to a few of them and they were cool. He was like 15 dudes sitting around, He lives out in the country, sitting around a campfire, big old roaring campfire, smoking cigars, hanging out. Um, and just, shooting the shit, talking about Jesus, talking about work, talking about what, like being a dad, like it wasn't like it was like a Bible study or anything, but of course, yeah, I mean, there's things that come up and we relate them because our foundation is in God. Like we relate to that, but that's why we're there. That's that iron sharpens iron mentality. And it's huge. It's huge, huge, huge to be in that. So you got to find something like that and, and not be scared to, uh, to check it out. Um, another couple ex- er, uh, options. I mentioned the mastermind group earlier when we started, we're starting that up. So if that's something that interests anybody out there listening, such a great way to find community, find a tight group of dudes who you can share and be a part of. Um, and there's all kinds of mastermind groups out there, not just sober guy ones, but you know, it's something to think about. Um, and then sober friends, meeting them at a meeting, um, it, there's, there's just so much more to this than just being alcohol free as we start to grow and find purpose in our life. Like, what do we, what do we like to do? So, um, all right, Kevin, great questions, man. I know I kind of went on a sideways track on some of them, but it's what I do sometimes, man. So I hope you got something out of that. I hope at least one thing stuck and I hope out there, you know, for those of you out there also listening, maybe you related to some of that. I have a couple more here and then, uh, and then we'll wrap up. This one's from, uh, Noel, what's up, Noel, man, miss you, dude. Good to, uh, good to hear from you. Thanks for the questions. Um, okay. Noel has two, even after 10, I'm going to try to move. I know I took a lot of time on Kevin's questions. Um, you know, no offense or anything, but, uh, try to go through these a little bit faster just cause I don't want to get so derailed. Uh, and then I'm, I'm babbling on like I'm doing right now. Okay. So, uh, no, I have two for you. Even after 10 years of sobriety, are there still events or situations that are triggers for you? If they are, what are they and what techniques do you use to de-escalate them? Do you just avoid some situations like watching a game at a bar altogether? So, man, the short answer, Noel, yes. Um, definitely still have those moments, still have those um, triggers uh, occasionally. They don't happen very often. They usually happen when I'm least expecting it. And then when I look back, I think that I'm, I'm probably not as spiritually fit as I thought I was when those happen. Uh, there's some sort of resentment. There's some sort of anger that's maybe inside that I'm not really recognizing because I've kind of put it away. I just think back to a couple of those moments when that's happened. Um, one, one in particular I can think of that just came to mind. We were, we had just, let's see, we had just moved back or just moved back into the new. Yeah, we just moved, we just moved into the new house in Vacaville. This was a couple years ago. And um, there was an event, a first responders event that some friends invited us to in Dixon. And uh, it was hosted by like the, you know, like the city and the, there was a bunch of cops there. And um, it, but, I mean, a bunch of families and stuff too. There was like a, 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 a raffle where you try to, they sell cakes and shit. And like, <laughs> like some dude buying like a cake for $600. <laughs> and it's like raffling it. It was fun, but Kind of, because I had a moment in there, and this is why I'm telling this, like, there was a shitload of beer in there, 
a lot of beer. There was a lot of drinking going on at this. And it was kind of ironic, man. But now that I think about it, there it was like for first responders and like suicide prevention and like depression. And it was a great event. I know they were trying to raise money, but it was just so strange because there was so much alcohol at the event. And, and I get that, you know, that's what makes money, but like you're making money off of the, you're making money off of the, the cause and the reason that you're there in the first place, which kind of didn't sit right with me. And it still kind of doesn't now that I think about it. Uh, but I mean, great people like hundred percent love all the people there, but okay. Anyway, so we're pulling up and, and a friend of ours, um, bought a table there and she invited, you know, a couple of us families or whatever. And for some reason, I don't know what it was. We were walking up. I started to have a poor me, a poor me moment. And I was just like, man, I just want to get hammered right now. I just wanted to just let loose and just, I wanted to escape. I didn't really want to be there and be sober. And I just like, it, it was so weird. Here's the good news. I got through it. It passed. I obviously didn't do that. But I told my wife immediately, I just really want to get, I think I said F, I just want to get fucked up right now. Like I was just like, I don't know what, it was the strangest thing. And this is what, seven, eight years in of being sober. So yeah, it happens. And it was kind of a strange setting the rest of the night. I just didn't feel 100% like myself. I think I still did a good job. We had a good time for the most part. But I think I remember being ready to go not too long after, you know, we ate and stuff. And um, so yeah, man, it definitely happens. And so I think like solution wise, like, what do you do? Do you just avoid situations? Like, yeah, sometimes it goes back to what I was saying about Kevin's question too, Noel, like, um, what's your intention? Am I supposed to be there? Like, am, am like, why am I here? Do I have a good reason to be here? Um, I was there to support, you know, our fam, our friends and first responders. So yeah, I, I felt like I did have a reason to be there. Um, could I have probably said no? Yeah. But like once I realized how much, you know, alcohol was a, a part of it, like, yeah, I may have. And I definitely didn't have $600 to buy a damn cake. So, you know, that wasn't happening either, <laughs> but, um, it, it happens even after years. And I think it goes back to game planning. You know, I'm so big on this. I've, I feel like I've talked about it so much, just having a game plan in all that we do parties, um, dinners, whatever it is, ha like create your own routine that fulfills you minus the alcohol, have some NA drinks ready, you know, have somebody ready to call, have a, a place to go if you need to bounce out early and leave. Um, that's, it's, it's really, really a big, a big part of this. And then I think too, like really at this point, I just, I just hate alcohol. I really do. Like I, it's just, it's destroyed so many people's lives that I know and that I love. Um, it's killed many people that I know and that I love. Um, and it's slowly killing many people that I know and that I love. And I just, um, I have this really disdain for it and how it's promoted and how it is, um, so normalized with the youth of today, um, you know, with sports events and everything. I just fucking hate it, to be honest. Like, I, I don't know how else to put it. Excuse my, my F word there, but I really do. And, um, I'm, I'm kind of done with trying to dance around it. Like, Oh, it's like, you know, oh, okay, well you can, you know, drink. And I mean, I guess I kind of even feel like a hypocrite saying that. I just said that about my wife and in Kevin's question earlier, like, oh, well, she has a glass of wine. I don't know, man. It's a tough one. <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess I'm kind of a uh, human and, uh, I'm, 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 uh, you know, I don't even know what the word is, man, but I, I do, I do hate it. And so, so here's why I'm saying that though, is because I think that helps me to build the foundation on why I don't ever want to go back to drinking again. Because if I can find reasons, it's like building a house. Like you don't just like move into the house and, you know, without building the foundation on it first, because if a storm hits, it's going to freaking blow off into the wind. If you hit a hurricane or a tornado or something, you have to build a strong foundation. And like, for me, I think building a strong foundation starts with God and spiritual connection, number one, and then building those walls up, that framing out those supporting legs, all the reasons, like, what's my why? Like, I have a lot of whys, like my health, my family, my marriage, um, the work that I get to do, my my pursuit in a relationship with God, my pursuit and purpose in doing sober guy and helping other people and being of service, 
Um, like there's a lot, a lot of different reasons. My, my pursuit in trying to help people understand that alcohol sucks and that there's literally no good purpose for it <laughs> other than to, uh, make us mindless zombies who are dead inside and spiritually disconnected. Like that, that's why there's alcohol. That's why it's so normalized because a population who is, um, who is dumbed down and who is high and drunk and out of their minds and relies on a, a poison, a literal poison, a substance to do life is easily manipulated and easily controlled. That's a whole another thought. So my point is that I have a lot of reasons on why I don't want to go back to that. And I think that helps. So to, to some, to sum it up, man, like, yes, like have a game plan, um, Knowing when to avoid situations and when to go and, and when not to is a huge part of it. Um, I already mentioned being kind of offering some, you know, a service or whatever, if you can be help, if you can help. But I think even after 10 years, you know, th those triggers are real and they do happen and you just got to be careful. You got to communicate about them. And you, I, I would say, here, here's the best thing, expect them, expect them. And then don't beat yourself up over it when it happens. Cause it will happen and it's normal. And it doesn't mean you're weird. It doesn't mean that like, oh my God, I'm going to go back to drinking. Like just, just expect it and, and, and sit in it and talk about it. Talk to somebody, text somebody, you know, jump in the group, call, talk to your spouse, call your, your mentor, your sponsor, or your friend, like communicate. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing and go, man, like I just had an urge. Like I just had, you know, or this, this like thing is really triggering me right now. Like, and, um, I think that's the best way to, to kind of know, where you're at and then and then also knowing your mood your emotional your spiritual state like asking yourself like am i good like am i in a good place right now to go to this event or whatever i think those are those are some big things so I hope that was helpful um next question from noel is there a part of your routine that you find most important um in maintaining your sobriety for some it's reading the big book or sober life literature prayer meditation writing a gratitude list uh, to help set the tone for their day and stay on the sober path. What's the thing you try to do every day and you know what you haven't that helps set your mind right and keep you uh, on, on the right path? Um, man, it's like really, really great, great question. Um, and I, I, I think that your, um, oh gosh, where'd it go? I just accidentally scrolled back down, but I think your points, Noel, of like, you know, the big book, reading the big book, sober literature, prayer, meditation, a gratitude list. Like those, those are all, I know you're just giving examples, but those are all things that I use and have used before and that I recommend to people all the time. So let's just start there. Like those are, those are great ones. Um, especially the gratitude list too. I think it's very over or underrated. Um, I know that, uh, my, my, you know, sponsor, mentor, friend, buddy C would, he, you know, had me do that quite a few times. Well, I want you to write a gratitude list. And I'd be like a gratitude list. Like that's gay. <laughs> Can I just use that term. Yes, I did. Man, dude, it comes from when we were like in sixth grade, you just said it was gay. Like, why can't we say that anymore? Does it doesn't, I have lots of gay friends. I love them. They're great. Like, I don't care. Like if you're gay, straight, whatever, like to each his own, it's between you and God. That's the way I see it. But uh, I think it's still funny sometimes just go, yeah, that's gay. Uh, <laughs> but like, I don't, the, the gratitude list, that's the way I thought I was like, oh, that's dumb. Like, I just don't, it's, I don't really like that. And, um, and it's so effective though. It's so effective. Like it's, it's the, like, it's such a great, and it's easy. It can take five minutes and you just write five minutes down, you know, like, okay, here's, you know, five things I'm grateful for today or 10 things that I'm grateful for right now in this moment. Cause it's real easy to find the things that you're not grateful for. That's easy. So gratitude list. I just wanted to kind of say like that. It's a really good one right there. Um, here's a couple of things for me. And then just before I get to this part, so I don't forget this cause I put the notes below it. Um, Noel, you, you said you have eight months and 10 days going strong. Uh, that sober guy is where I first came and found that there's a better way for me. So man, dude, congrats. Eight months, 10 days. Like, Noel, I remember, you know, talking, you and Ray met up at one point because you guys were out in the Texas uh, area or Houston area. And uh, man, like what a, what a cool thing to still have you kind of sticking around and 
um, just being able to, uh, to connect. And I appreciate the questions today too, man. And congrats again. Um, so a couple other things for me, that's important in, in maintaining routine, um, fitness and walking are huge. Like, like now I'm at a point where I'll give you an example, like between fitness, like I'll go to the gym. Um, I've been out for like over a month, you know, until just like just a couple of days ago, um, where I'm just starting to feel like a little bit better. But in the past too, like I'll go when I, when I am on a good, a good run, um, and staying on the top of my game and fitness and going to the gym, all that stuff. And I'm in a good routine. Like it feels odd to not do a hard workout, put it that way. Like, you know how it is like when you go and you're like, Oh, I don't want to go to the gym. You know, and like you've heard that saying, like the hardest machine at the gym is the front door. Like it's true. It's hard to get there sometimes. Usually once you're there, like anything, it's not as bad as you think. Well, when you get dialed in and that's part of your like lifestyle, it's really hard to go. Like I have a hard time going to the gym and going, uh, I'm just going to do like something easy today. Like I'll do that sometimes. Then as soon as I get there, I'm like full speed ahead, like kicking my own ass, like challenging myself. I'm going hard all the time, whenever I can, most of the time, every once in a while I have an off day, normal, but like for the most part, man, that's a huge part of, of how I, um, maintain my mental, like sober soberness, like my just, and then obviously there's physical results of that too. You feel good physically, but the mental stuff is huge. Um, the other one walking like late, like I like night walks. I think I've mentioned this before. Night walks after dinner is a, is a really, really good way just to kind of meditate, move your body, um, feel good. Like it's, it's a great way to do it. And it's easy. Everybody, most people can walk, right? If you can't, man, that's, I don't even know why I said that. Like, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm not laughing either, but I'm just, I think, I think I take that for granted sometimes that, Oh, I have two. And so that's another good thing. Like to roll into the gratitude list stuff, right? Do you have two legs? Do you have two arms? Do you have two eyes? And like, we overlook that stuff. It's huge. Imagine if you couldn't walk. Like if there's anybody listening to this that can't walk, like, man, that's, I mean, you, and you're probably crushing it though in your own right, because you're strong and you're strong willed and you understand the, um, you know, you understand the, the, to not, you know what? I can't even, I don't even know. I'm trying to explain that. And like, I, I don't even know, like I didn't plan on going down that path right there, but I'll just leave it at the gratitude part. Like you have two arms, you have two legs, you could see, you can, you can hear, you can smell, you know, you can walk. Like when you are lazy ass sitting on your couch, oh, ugh, ugh, I'm tired. Like be like, damn, like I got two legs. Like God gave me this healthy body that I'm turning into dog shit right now because I'm not doing anything. No, I'm not talking to you, by the way. I'm just talking to you. <laughs> I just had to make sure I clarified that there. I'm saying in general, like anybody, like that gratitude stuff is huge, man. And it will help you maintain that sobriety. So just the little things, man, when you're running, like I've been running before my legs are just on fire or doing squats and my legs are just on fire. One of the things that helps me is I'm like, Oh God, thank you for these legs. Thank you that they work right now, dude. And it's just enough. It's just enough to get through what I need to get through right there. And that is a state of gratitude. It's huge. Um, the second one, and this should probably be the first one, and it really is the first one. I don't know why I numbered them like this. Not, it's, I guess it's irrelevant at this point, but is Jesus. Um, I have to not only stay away from alcohol, I have to stay sober-minded. And the only way that I can do that is through Jesus Christ, because sin is real. The battle between flesh and spirit is real. Uh, and the only provision for man's sin is Jesus Christ. So do I want to live in the world? Here's what I have to ask myself. It's a great question. Do I want to live in the world and, and be world-minded, right? Obviously, I have to live in the world, but just hear me out real quick. Do I want to live in the world and be world-minded? Or do I want to live in the spirit and be kingdom-minded, sober-minded? It's a really interesting question to ask. And if you've never thought about that before, um, think about that. And let me say it again, because I know it's, it's like, it's kind of crazy actually to think about. And I've been pondering this and going back and forth on this for a long, long time. And I've came to the conclusion I'm either batshit crazy or I'm hundred percent right. So 
you know, that's for, that's for between me and God, I guess. Um, but do we want to be, I'm sorry, do we want to live in the world and be world minded? Everything. So what does that mean? Everything in the world is important. The money, the, you know, the notoriety, my job, my career, um, you know, my car that I drive, like everything is very meaningful to me in this worldly, um, you know, this worldly place, right? When really at the end of the day, we don't take any of it with us. We didn't bring any of the worldly stuff into the world with us. And we sure as shit don't take any of it with us when we die. So is the, the question would be, is it really that important? Is it really, is it really that important? Is it really that meaningful? And in my experience at this point in my life, the scales are definitely tipping way more to the side of no, it's meaningless. No, it's vanity. No, it's not important. And so, um, and then contrary to that, do I want to live in the world is, or do I want to live in the spirit and be kingdom minded, sober minded, believing in God, believing in something higher, believing in something that is potentially more to this world, more to this world. There's more after this world, where does our soul move on to? Where does it go? What does it do? You know, and, and something bigger, the kingdom, you know, God's kingdom. Uh, it's, 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 I know it's crazy to think about, and I'm not talking about religion here. Once again, I'm just talking about man trying to connect to something higher, man trying to connect to God, trying to connect with the spirit that lives inside of us. And, and, and there's something to that that is um, very complex. It's very confusing. Uh, so you're not weird if you're thinking like, what? And like, this is crazy. Or I've thought about that, but I don't know. Like, dude, it's totally normal. First Peter 5, 8, check this one out. Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So I found a short explanation on this through the Bible app, which, which I thought was great. And I just kind of wanted to read through it too. So basically, so let me read that one more time too. First Peter 5, 8, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. So sobriety, being sober minded and watchfulness are very necessary and they're very useful in life, right? And, and you can't really have one without the other. Um, unless a man is sober, uh, in body and in mind, he will not be watchful either over himself or others or against the snares of sin, Satan and the world. And if he is not on his watch and guard, he's very liable to every sin and every temptation. That's why we feel sometimes we go. And I think this comes from the apostle Paul. I can't remember what verse, um, off the top of my head right now, but basically he says, I know what I don't want to do, but I still do it. <laughs> and I know what I should do, but I don't do it. And I, I messed that up in, in context there, but that's, you know, I, I don't have the scripture in front of me, but that's kind of, isn't that the condition of man? Isn't that the condition of almost every dude out there? Like we know what we're supposed to do. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. We know what's wrong and we still do it. Why? Why? Because that is the human condition of sin, of being born into it. And the only provision to bridge that gap, the connection between you and God is Jesus. That's it. Like, so um, let, me, let me go on here. Be prudent and cause your heart to understand, referring them not to temperance of body, but sobriety of mind and to a prudent conduct and behavior as having a subtle as well as a malicious enemy to deal with. So, so basically the world is going to throw a lot of shit at us and we can't do it on our own. Let me just speak for myself. I can't do it on my own. Um, there's been so many things that have, um, you know, happened in my life where I'm just, I, I can't even believe I'm alive some days and I can't even believe I'm sane some days. It's all by the grace of God. It really is. And, uh, that's not something that's earned. That's not something that is, um, you know, it's like, I need to do better, do good, do good. It doesn't mean don't be a good person, 
but that grace is given to us as a gift. And until we accept that and we surrender to it and submit to it, and it's an ongoing process, it doesn't, it doesn't just, um, you know, it it doesn't just come easy to us. We still have to deal with the day-to-day grind. And I hear a lot die daily. You hear that? Like, man, we got to live in this world, but we're not of this world is what I'm, what I'm saying. Okay. Another one I wanted to share too, Romans 12. And if you, if you don't read the Bible, um, man, Romans is a great, a great book. Romans 12 in particular, my, my sponsor and friend and mentor buddy would have me read Romans 12 a lot. Just, and it's short. Another one is Ecclesiastes as well. It's another, another great one. Um, when I first got sober, someone had suggested, man, you need to read Ecclesiastes. So it was like the first book that I really actually sat down and read in the Bible because it's geared towards men. It was written by Solomon, the smartest man in the entire universe. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. And it talks a lot about the vanity, the meaningless. And you'll hear some of those terms that I mentioned earlier. That's where that comes from. Uh, but Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I'll just say I'm constantly in process of this. It's something I think about every single day. It's something that I um, am, I, I strive for excellence, not perfection. It doesn't mean that I have... Um, you know, an, an ability to just do whatever I want at the same time and just think it's okay. I'm very conscious of behaviors and thoughts and actions and all of that stuff, but it doesn't mean I'm perfect. And the older I get, the more I realize that, um, as it says in Romans 12, conforming to the patterns of the world is empty. Um, and a lot of the things, if we tie this back into alcohol, if you think about the drinking, that's a way to stay disconnected from reality. It's a way to stay in, um, a really small tight bubble of the world itself. And that's not a great place to be. Um, I I really do feel like it robs the spirit and the connection of, of God. And so, um, I was, I mean, I can't believe this has already gone over an hour. I was not planning on that at all, but I want to finish this. We got one more question from Roscoe. Um, a couple things I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go over. I was going to go over the, the four spiritual laws, but we'll do that in another, uh, another episode. Maybe I'll just focus on that. Uh, Noel, thanks for the questions, man. Um, I, I hope that something I said, you know, speaks to you and speaks to others out there listening. Great questions. Um, and, uh, re- really good to connect. And then last question from Roscoe, man, appreciate you, Roscoe. I know you've been following the show and been part of the group for a while now. And, uh, really just thank you, man, for taking the time to, uh, to throw, throw a question or two out there. Um, has there ever been a point during your sobriety journey when you thought that not utilizing this second chance at life? Oh, when you've thought that you're not utilizing the second chance at life. If so, what did you do? How did you flip that perspective and start really taking advantage of this blessing? Such a great, a great question. And your man, the last thing you said, it um, start really taking advantage of this blessing. That's exact. You just nailed it on the head, bro. Like that's exactly what this platform is. It's a blessing. It's a purpose for me. It's a purpose for me to stay on track and to be able to be a vessel for God to use and to talk to other men out there and to share my experience and thoughts and listen and hear their experience and thoughts and feedback and questions and like all of that, man, it's such a blessing. Obviously the sobriety is a blessing. The connection is a blessing. My family is a blessing. Like it just depends. Like I can look at all that stuff and go, man, thank you. Thank you, God. Even on the worst day and some, sometimes like this whole kidney stone thing. Oh man, there were some bad days in that there were some bad days. I'm, I'm still kind of coming off of the tail end of this and trying to, I have a doctor's appointment coming up just in a couple of days, actually to kind of figure out the next steps. And I got to get back to work full time and man, it's been brutal. But even in some of those days, other than when I was laying on the bed in excruciating pain in my back and my kidney going, God, please kill me. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'm literally not joking. I was literally like, I just, just kill me. This is just terrible, right? That's how bad it hurt. Um, and, but you know, beyond that, we have those moments, right? But gosh, it, what a blessing it is. And I'm, that's why this new perspective, you know, I was talking about in the beginning of the podcast is big too. Cause it's like, man, that, that puts a lot when you, when your health is jacked up and you think you're dying, 
it puts a lot of stuff in perspective and you get to see, uh, see certain things as you should see them as blessings. And that's good. Uh, so you, and you also said, take care and keep up the awesome work. Um, a long time supporter. I know, man, I, I appreciate you again. So what point in your sobriety when you thought, you know, when you realize you're not utilizing the second plan and I, I've definitely gotten bored before, man, I really have. Um, I always go back to my purpose though. And I feel like in my heart, like my purpose is to serve God. My purpose is to serve my family. That means be a great dad, be a great husband, be a great son, um, be a great man. You know, the best of my ability, like I said, doesn't mean perfection, but I strive for excellence, man. I want to be the best I can in all aspects. And, you know, I struggle sometimes at certain points, like everybody else. Um, I also want to serve those who are looking to find their own purpose and, I, you know, who, who want to cut alcohol out of their lives because it's such a... It's, it's such a, um, oh gosh, it's such, it, it just, it just prohibits people from taking that next point in their life. And it actually stops them in their tracks. That's why you hear people say, oh man, he's like, he stuck at like 16 or 17. Cause that's when he started drinking and he's never grown up from that. Like it really, really stunts your growth is what I'm saying. So, and there, there's, you know, there's people who come to their senses at some point in life and have a spiritual awakening, making maybe, and they just go, man, I just don't want this anymore. I, I can't do this. Um, I also tend to complicate things. And in the first few years of my own sobriety, I really complicated the crap out of things and I set many expectations. So to answer your question, you know, about not utilizing um, I think I got lazy and I got bored sometimes and, um, got complacent at times because I set these like high expectations for what I was going to do or what I wanted to do. And that was like, expectations are your worst enemy. Like having no expectations is great. It doesn't mean we don't have goals and visions and, and dreams. We absolutely do. And we should for all of us, we should have all of that, but when we start getting into the expectations part of that, that can be dangerous. And so I think I had some of those and I think it comes back to just keeping it simple, keeping it simple. Um, and I, you know, I, it's funny that this came up because I was reading in the morning the other day, I was in Timothy in first Timothy six, uh, six through seven, it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world. That's like I was saying earlier, and we can take nothing out of it, but God. So let me just read that first line again. Godliness with contentment is great gain. To me, that just speaks like, keep it simple. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's about my relationship with God and blessing our family and, and being in connection with him and being in connection with something higher and understanding that this world is temporary. That is, that is the great gain and that is keeping it simple. That's keeping it so simple. And, and I think that when we can do that and we can be content right where we're at, it doesn't mean we're not going to have struggles and problems sometimes, man, we are. It sucks sometimes too. It's tough. But if we can keep it simple and we can be content and understand that we're right where we're supposed to be. I think that is a huge win and it takes and alleviates a lot of that pressure, a lot of that stress. Um, and, and it, it helps us see things in a positive light, the glass half uh, full instead of half empty, right? No expectations. All right. Um, and then one more, I want to share, and we're going to wrap up Ecclesiastes four, four, like I mentioned too, you know, and I should, I should probably say this. There's a great book. It's called every man's Bible. I've given it to a few of my friends, um, you know, and I just, it's one of those things that is just really had a pretty big impact on me and it's, it's geared towards men and it breaks down a lot of different things. So I think you can find it on Amazon. I definitely recommend that every man's Bible. Um, if, if that's something that interests you, but Ecclesiastes four, four, and I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Man, you hear that a lot in Ecclesiastes, meaningless, a chasing after the wind, vanity. And it just, it just spoke to me so much over the years. And I continue to read in that and, and have different thoughts and realizations with that. And that's the great thing about 
you know, the word is that it's the living word. And you read one thing one day, it might mean something to you in one way. And then you read it again the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. And all of a sudden you see something else and you go, wow, that's crazy. I didn't even think about that. Wow. It changes something in you. And so the world, the battle between flesh and spirit, the battle between the world and world mindset, the kingdom mindset is real. All this stuff that we're talking about today, great questions. But I think to, to kind of tie this all together, what I'd like to say before we end is that this is so much bigger than just drinking. It's so much bigger than just alcohol or addiction or, um, you know, being so wrapped up in, in all of that. This is about freedom. This is literally about freedom. This is about the battle between the everlasting life, the kingdom mindset, and the worldly mindset. It doesn't mean that we don't live in the world. We do. We do. But if you read the word, you're, you'll start to understand and you'll start to think and you'll start to question, you'll start to ask yourself things. It doesn't mean everything's going to make sense either and that you're just going to fall right. It doesn't mean that we don't question everything. Man, I've questioned so much stuff. I still do. I think that's healthy. That's how we that God gave us brains to use, to critically think. It's okay. But I think as we grow in it, and I'll speak for myself, as I've grown in it and questioned and asked, like I've really, I really have, like God spoke to me in so many different ways and shown me so many different things that at the end of the day, it's meaningless. Like my, my family, my friends, um, you know, and being of service to others is, is, is really honestly like the, the purpose of this life, like 100%. Like I know it, does, it doesn't mean I'm perfect at it. it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect at it, but we can strive to be excellent at it. And as we open up more and as we surrender more and submit more, God uses us more. And I think it's, it's such a beautiful thing. And the, for the first step for a lot of people is, is cutting that alcohol out in order to start down that path. And I'm just telling you that you can do it. It's not impossible. If I can do it, you can do it. So um, I hope something spoke to you today. I just appreciate you guys. Um, Roscoe, Noel, um, Kevin, the questions. Thank you so much. Um, if, uh, if you, uh, well, another thing, share the podcast with a friend. That's one thing. If you're looking for ways to quit drinking, you can go to that sober Lots of courses, mastermind groups, coaching options. Um, book a strategy session with me. Uh, send us an email if you want, if you're interested in doing the sober shout outs or, um, uh, ask me anything for the following month. Sorry, my mind's just like shot right now. Lots of stuff on it, but uh, appreciate you guys tuning in today. Thank you again. Peace, love, and respect. Keep your blood clean. <laughs>